Should be dead, right? We're no, we're alive now. We're alive. We're alive. We're alive. Okay, so this uh, is so John. I was going to say something, something even more stupid. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up, everybody. The, John, no, it's, been, it's yeah. been good, Tommy. I think um, the purpose of those webinars, as you know, we mentioned it last time, it's you know. It, it, it's harder working out at home than people think. I mean, you and I have done it a little bit, you know, prior to COVID, but a lot of people, this is their first attempt. And <clears throat> it's, it's almost takes a skill to stay focused, not go to the fridge every five minutes, you know, not walk the dog every 10 minutes. Um, then you've got all sorts of distractions, many of which are lovely, you know, playing with kids and all sorts of things. But I think it is a skill. But as you were mentioning before, Tommy, I think, uh, I mean, the world is going to change in a better way because there are so many of these things we're doing which are really effective and efficient. And, you know, you don't have to. I mean, I was, someone was telling me yesterday, Will Ainsworth and John was telling me he did three virtual appraisals, listing appraisals, not, not just kind of the three-minute desktop ones. I'm talking about full-blown listing presentations virtually online in this scenario. And he said he thinks he's going to get them all and, and it was a, sort of a great outcome. But I think you've got to be agile and flexible right now and you've got to be looking for things. You're on mute there, Tom. Oh, I'm going I'm 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 to ask, ask you both this. Like, on that issue, John, on working effectively from home, have you been able to work out a few do's and don'ts? And I'm going to ask the same thing to you, Troy. Yeah, look, I think um, you need to schedule harder and like to do lists and things more at home than you do at work because it works so there's a flow of energy and you've often got meetings with other people that are relevant to your projects whereas at home you can blink and it's kind of like late morning and then you say I'll go and have an early lunch so I think you're having a to-do list and, a sh and even scheduling things in so I'm going to spend an hour writing this then another hour doing that and then another hour on this and then schedule the, the zoom meetings in so I think scheduling is is really really critical troy yeah you've got to have that routine john and, and we were talking only this morning uh with one of our guests on the webinar about sprints and i think it's very easy when you're at home to get sucked into the i'm just going to sit in front of the two-dimensional computer screen and continue to work and i'm going to work as hard as i can i'm going to blink and it's going to be lunchtime or it's going to be afternoon and i'm going to be brain fried those 50 minute sprints or like John was saying, an hour sprint and then get up and actually do something, go for a walk, um, go and put maybe a load of washing on, go and get yourself a coffee from the coffee machine, whatever that is for you, just make sure you've got that gap in your time, the same way you would do it at work or the same way you would travel to the next meeting. Uh, if you're <coughs> around. No specific advice, Troy, as you remember, was 50 minute sprints and then 10 minute give your brain a relaxation. So, you know, if you've got six key projects, well, one an hour if you're working on six um, with a 10 minute break at the end to keep yourself fresh. Mm. So yeah, but what about you, Tom? You, you do a lot of work from home. What do you find? So I, I was fortunate enough, News Corp had an arrangement with me that uh, for the last four years of employment at News Corp, they allowed me to actually uh, choose to work from home or work from work, right? And that was, that was the deal. Um, and the one thing I've learned is that an appointment is normally scheduled in your diary and you know you go to that appointment. For instance, this is an appointment. Where I actually find that I had to get rigorous on is move things in the, from the to-do list that weren't an appointment and actually create an appointment. So each day when you woke up, you sort of would look at your diary and it would say nine till five. There might be appointments, but then when there wasn't appointments, if there's project work, it wasn't, it, it actually went in as an appointment. So you knew that you were doing that from 11 to 12. So, um, and it takes, I've got to tell you, I think for a lot of real estate agents, the ability, the ability to handle free time is a big skill. Entrepreneurs are normally good at it because they've got this knack about doing the highest productive thing at any one time. Whereas a lot of time, other people have this addiction to distraction. They seem to run to the things that, that um, scream loudest. And I think what good entrepreneurs do is they actually scream at maybe the things that are silent but are important. Um, but uh, uh, I'm getting, I interviewed Sam Rogopoulos yesterday from um, Jealous Craig. He's a good real estate agent in the inner north there. And, and um, he said to me that he feels that there are elements of working from home that he's going to carry on post-COVID 
but uh, there are elements that he thinks have to return back to the way that they were. Um, so I don't know, John, do you think, and Troy, do you think that you're going to, like, do you think there are elements of, of what you're doing now that you're going to carry on in, like, most likely looks like it's going to be June, June, July, who knows, maybe May. What do you think? Yeah, 100%. I think um, definitely 33% of meetings could be handled very efficiently in this. I mean, it's nice to have face-to-face with someone. That's why Zoom's better than a phone call. But, you know, you have to fire up your car, you know, half a tonne of steel and drive for 20 minutes to do that. Or can you just click the click the mouse? So I think costs, because I think, yeah, margins in all business, Tom, you know, this is, not a, this is not a COVID thing, I think. This is more of just a reality of the industry. Margins are getting squeezed. Agents' commissions have gone up a bit. I'm talking about principals' margins. And, and vendor commissions have been a bit compressed. So I think you combine those, you know, there is a bit of a squeeze. So people have to find more efficient and indeed scalable ways so they can actually do it at less cost and they can do it with more people. And I think something like Zoom, and I'm, you know, Zoom is a good one. I'm sure there's 10 other good ones, but we just happen to use Zoom. I think it's, it's important going forward. So I, I really think that's going to be the other thing I think that's going to, there's going to be a few things impact the real estate consumer side of the industry. I think regional lifestyle locations are going to become in hot demand because everyone's just proven to themselves and their employers and their employees they can be just as effective uh, from from th- two or three hours away as they are from sitting in the office, like you were, Tom, when you're at news. So, I think that there's going to be a little bit of a, <clears throat> uh, a strong push for lifestyle locations, sea change, tree change. Um, interestingly, I think we've seen a lot of downsizes over the over the last decade or two. I think we might even see some upsizes because if one or two people in the household have all of a sudden decided they're going to spend two or three days a week working from home you've got to be able to accommodate that as well. So I think this whole COVID thing is going to change people's priorities. And I think it's going to change the way they live. And, and none of those things, we're, it's not going to cost us any money. In fact, if you work at uh, Mornington or if you work at Sunshine Coast or if you work on the central coast of Sydney, you're probably going to be a gross beneficiary of that because there are going to be a lot more people. I mean, right now I could be at Boca Beach going for a swim in the morning a swim in the afternoon after work and working for eight hours on Zoom pretty effectively and when I do have to come to Sydney it's an hour away so I Johnny can I can I can I just ask you Troy is John's buffering coming a little bit uh, are you noticing anything or is it smooth smooth at your end he's okay with me it's it's funny Tom we were talking about technology he's actually coming through okay with me now before it was a little bit um, just a bit jumpy. Technology's really fast-tracked everything for us. It's brought everything forward about three or four years, in my opinion, and I couldn't agree more with what John was saying in the fact that lifestyle and upsizing is probably going to become the new norm. If you've got two people working at home, you essentially, and you're doing a lot of Zoom meetings or you're having a lot of phone conversations, you're essentially going to probably need two offices. The other trend I'm seeing is a lot of people are now desiring to have a home gym or a space that they can exercise because that's what they're allowed to do. So a lot of the garages now are getting converted into gymnasiums and they're moving the cars. And I know that I've done that myself. I actually see that people will be looking for additional space or additional rooms that they can set up those types of atmospheres. So they necessarily don't have to be traveling and having all these additional expenses if they're not required and just getting focused on using technology to do the same things that they were doing pre COVID. Okay. I presume that's an invite to Matt Steinway to come and work out with you. Is it? Absolutely. Any time. He's. Have you seen? Have you seen Matt's Instagram? He's. Um. He's training very hard at the moment. He's looking fantastic. He's a fittest, fittest fifty-year-old or forty-nine-year-old guy that is on the planet. Let's move on to real estate mode because I actually think we've got uh, 10, 10 ideas that agents can use immediately. Um, we've uh, carved out ten good ones. John, I'm going to uh, start off with you. It might end up becoming more than ten. Um, let's just see how it goes. John, what, 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 are, what are some of the things that you've heard in the last month from the agents you've been talking to uh, that yeah. really inspired you? So some of these are things you can do, Tom. Some of these that I've come up with that had the most impact on me were, were different ways of seeing the world or even quotes that make you shift your mind. So I'm going to combine two into the first point for me. One was um, Matt Steinway. He was, I think, one of our second or third we had on a few weeks ago. And I said to him, you know, what, what changes have you made? And he said, you know, John, to be honest, me and my team are just working as though this hasn't even happened. And I, I, 
with the obviously protocols in place. So, you know, no disrespect, he's, you know, he's been following all that. But I think the thing is everyone's become so infatuated, Tom, with this whole COVID and staring it at the news and watching it on Twitter. And it's, it's actually, it's felt like we, a lot of people have convinced themselves you can't continue to do business in, in the same way. And I'm talking again with, with, with regard to that there are some changes, but overall, and Matt just says, you know, we prospect, we list, we sell, we show properties now one-on-one. Um, so I think, you know, for me, just, it seems a very simplistic thing that if you shift your mindset to say, let's just keep going with the protocols. So that was one. The other thing was Paulie Checker, who's a dear friend of yours and mine, Tom, um, sent me a great quote. I think he sent it to you as well from Nelson Mandela. And he said, when, the, when the, someone interviewed him after 27 years in isolation, and let's just put our situation in, in perspective, you know, we're being asked for a month or six weeks or two months to sit at home in, in comfortable homes with internet connections and Netflix and kids around you and you can go for a walk and do all that sort of good stuff. He, he had to be in isolation 27 years in rough jails and, and he, he, he was asked when he got out, they said, how did you survive 20 years of isolation? And he said, I wasn't surviving, I was preparing. And that mm. hit me and I thought, well, wow, I wasn't surviving. So I reckon the key is now, what, what do I take out of that for our, our, our MBA listeners? You must use this to come back a better, stronger real estate person, person in general post COVID than you were before. If you're waiting for COVID to finish, and hoping you survive, you are missing so much of an opportunity. You should be working on yourself, on your physical, on your mental, on your emotional, on your listings, on your scripts and dialogues, on your negotiation techniques. Um, if you've got a team, on the way your team structures, uh, all those sort of things. And I think now, M Mandela said, I wasn't surviving, I was preparing. This is the time to prepare for a post-COVID surge. So they're my two first ideas from one of my three. Troy. Um, one of my ideas was more of a confirmation is, you know, what's the story that you're actually telling yourself, which kind of flows on from what you were saying, John, the story that we've been telling ourselves, some of us is that this is forever going to be bad for business. The ones that are doing great business and John, we've heard stories from some of our team that have sold three, four, five properties within the week and had 17 inspections on one property on one day uh, being last Saturday. The ones that see the opportunity and adapt their business are the ones that are going to see when the surge comes, they're going to see their businesses triple, quadruple um, to the nth degree, um, very sharp, very fast and very sharp because they're the ones that have adapted and seen it for what it is. And it is an opportunity to change. Yes, there are some bad things that are happening and continuing to happen. But I think what we've seen now is the reports are saying that we're coming probably past midway point, this is going to be a great opportunity for those that are really agile to adapt and thrive as opposed to stay in that headspace of the story is not great. That was a benchmark I shared with you this morning, Tommy, early on when I just said Alex Mintorn, who we interviewed yesterday, um, uh, four sales last week, averaging about two and a quarter million. Um, he had uh, 13, it was actually 13 Troy's at the one property. 13 one-on-one right. -on -one private inspections at the one property that he listed 11 days ago, 13 on last Saturday, sold at exchange at 7.30 at night. And uh, yesterday when we did the, or two days ago when we did the uh, <clears throat> webinar with him, he had five or six, he wasn't sure, five or six one-on-one -on -one appointments. And he said his team members have that as well. All day, every day, their diaries are booked out. And we kind of work roughly, they had as a team about 50 one-on-one -on -one appointments between Tuesday and Saturday. And I only share that, not, you know, not, he's embarrassed because he's a humble guy, but you, you've got to realise people that are out there thinking no one wants to look at property. I think there's a surge of people that want to buy while COVID's in place without sounding opportunistic, but they actually think that post-COVID there'll be a surge back to the, where the prices were. So I think there is a large number of buyers that actually want to buy right now. Whereas the mindset, as to Troy's point, the narrative some agents have about themselves is, oh, no one really wants to buy. And they almost... They make people feel fearful by talking to them, whereas, you know, Mintorn's just there, appointment after appointment. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a good point. Tommy, how about you? So, a couple of things. Firstly, I will say, too, and a lot of people uh, know him because you were scheduled to speak at Eric, and he sometimes can be a little bit uh, uh, full on on social media, but we talk about buyers. Josh Tesselin has done 17 genuine sales in the month of April, right? 17 people went off 
and paid money to buy a home. And on Friday, for the gym members, we're going to go through everything he's doing, but I can pretty much summarize it. He's pretty doing nothing different to what he was doing before, right? That's pretty much the short version. But a couple of things that come to mind. Uh, Sam Rogopoulos said the number one thing he's pushing through his group at Jealous Crave is to have a strong launch list. So yep. we, we clearly know that there, in, in many ways, this is a bit like December 1, where you know you've got this Christmas period happening, you've got people taking time off, but you also know that come Australia Day, there's a lot of property that's going to be launched onto the market. So what are our viewers and listeners doing at the moment to get that launch list signed up and ready to go? Because we do know that's going to be closer to June than when it is going to be November based on the infection rate at the moment and the dialogue. So the launch list. The second thing is when you're getting offers of buyers, when you're getting offers of buyers, and it can be a bit challenging because there's a bit of uncertainty, a good thing to ask a buyer is, listen, if you like the house and you're concerned about what you're saying about, give me a future price offer today and I'll go and see if I can wrap it up. And what that basically means is if you think that the market's going to drop 5 10%, factor that into your number, I'll go speak to my owner and we're going to try and come to an agreement on whether it's the price or whether it's the settlement or any terms, and we can come to an agreement. Because if you like the house, it'd be stupid to make a decision on buying a home based on the market and not based on your life, right? So I think, you know, having agents that are good creating urgency there, and, and I will say this, Troy and John, a client said to me yesterday, he said, and he's a small office, right? He's a small office. He said, Tom, for the first time, I see I've got a bit of an opportunity. And I go, why is that? He goes, you know, he goes, you know, have you ever been on an airplane where you've been flying, say, and you got off at Dubai and there's business class, there's first class, there's economy class, and everyone's been sitting on the plane in their three class categories. And then you get off the plane and there's a bus that picks you up from the tarmac and takes you to the terminal. And everyone all of a sudden is equalized, like all bets are off. It doesn't matter where you started, what category you were before, you're all sitting on a bus. And to me, it says like, it's a blank canvas for everyone. And the person that can adjust in the bus is gonna be the person that actually has that advantage in the new market. And you sent me a text message about two weeks ago, John, where you said, never waste a good crisis. Mm -hmm. Or never waste a crisis, right? And I know never waste a good crisis. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, and I think the opportunity is we are getting an equalisation, and it's going to be obvious that fast is going to beat anything, whether it's big or small. Fast as we come off the blocks. So that's been a lot of the stuff, and there's no question about it. There's this big focus now of moving from what is called a quantitative market to a qualitative market. And what we mean by that is that you probably will work with less buyers and you'll work with less sellers. So the quantity won't be there, but the quality is going to be so much better. And that's what every agent is saying. Yeah, we think there's about two thirds, roughly two thirds of buyers are sitting on the sidelines that were active before. But you're right, Tom, it means a third are still there and those third are out actively buying and they obviously either are not concerned about this or they actually want to buy during this. A couple more that I, uh, I've i noted down here. Jess Smith, that you remember, Tom, she spoke yes. Eric, um, Canberra, million dollar agent, delightful human being. She said two things that I remember very clearly. She said, um, I'm seeing this period, and by the way, we spoke to her about two weeks ago when we actually thought there was going to be a lockdown which would have prevented us even showing property which hasn't happened. Um, she said, I'm seeing this a bit like Christmas. She said, just before you go to break at Christmas, over Christmas, it's hard to sell much property. Everyone goes away and you've just got to really just, you know, enjoy yourself. And she said, so I'm, I'm making hay while the sun shines. She said, I've got another week, I reckon, where I can video my properties, get my buyers through, get my properties listed on my pipeline, all those kind of things. So she says, I'm working feverishly at a point to, probably a bad metaphor, by the way. I'm working hard right now to get to a point where when we do go into lockdown, which we haven't yet. Um, so that was one. The other thing she said, every single vendor, she said, I'm categorizing them into 30, 60, 90 day plans. She said, the 30 of those vendors that said to me, Jess, we don't have the luxury of waiting. We'd like to, like to get it sold now, ASAP. So they're people that are recognize the market. They realize prices might've come back a little bit and they're still saying, go for it. The 60 day of people that are saying, look, I would like to sell now, but I think it's, it's kind of deteriorated a bit. If you can find a buyer good, 
if I have to restart after after the lockdown, which hasn't happened, that's okay. And the 90 was really, the category was people that have said to her, look, I, I just want to wait and see. I think everything's going to be fine, but I just rather, I'm happy to list with you, happy to get photos taken, but I don't really want to expose the property yet. So I, I like those two. I like the metaphor of, you know, treat it like Christmas. It's a bit like, you know, the law of contrast with Mandela. You know, if you think about 27 years in isolation in cold prisons and mush for dinner, lunch and, and breakfast, versus what we're putting up with, we, sh we really should shut up and just get on with life, really. Um, one, and two is if you treat, it, treat this period like Christmas, okay, we're in a bit of lockdown, we can't access as many buyers, but we can prepare or relax. Some people might say, I'm gonna take a two week holiday, which is up to them, that's fine. The last one I'm gonna share with you, Tom, because then I'll be done for the day, and then, then you guys have got the floor, but this is something, Troy, very early on, I think it was the first one. I think this is a combination of something that I've come up with and also Matt King. I think right now vendors are looking for a certain um, a certain energy and a certain feel with agents and they're not getting it from many. So I would love our, your listeners, our listeners to <clears throat> write down. I think right now people are looking for calm. If you are out there showing nervousness, showing fear, a bit of chaos, you're looking a bit disheveled, a little bit uncertain about the times, if you're kind of looking like a lot of people are feeling, not good. So you need to steady yourself, meditate, organise yourself, get calm, calm. Next thing they're looking for is confidence. If you're out there again, you know, Michael Dowling said to us the other day, he said he just listed a property against a really good agent and he said, why do you, why'd you give me the listing? He said, well, the other agent's really good, but they just, they just didn't feel like they need confidence about what's happening at the moment. So calm confidence the next one is enthusiastic you can be calm and enthusiastic you have to let them know you want the listing you want to you want to look after them and a lot of people in the face of fear and chaos they lose they lose that enthusiasm it's almost like gee i almost subconsciously hope i don't get this listing that was the third thing the next one is empathetic this is not a time to be shoving a self-interested strategy down the throat of a seller Everything's fine, yeah, just list it, no problem. This thing's going to pass up. You have to sit down and say, Tonya, how are you guys feeling right now about the situation? What are your options? How, what, what are you inclined to do? If I wasn't here and you had to make a decision, what does it, you have to be empathetic and, again, use questions to really find out how people are because this is absolutely not a time to be a salesman. It's a time to be a trusted advisor. The last one is strategic. You must have a plan. The plan that you used pre-COVID may not be the plan you're using now. It might have been, you know, sign here, auction date, $8,000 marketing, all good, open it next Saturday. Well, some of those things are just not applicable anymore. So right now you have to assess what is your plan? What does your plan fit this particular vendor and this particular property? So I'll just summarise it again. You need to have a calm energy. You need to have a confident aura. You need to display enthusiasm for the business and for the, for the industry still. You have to be better at listening and empathetic than ever before. And you have to have a plan that makes sense right here, right now. So that's the kind of five things that uh, I, uh, I felt. Troy, over to you. That's outstanding, by the way, John. There's a, that, that five minutes, there's a template for anyone that, that may have been uh, waking up at 9.30 and, and sort of getting into the groove of actually not having uh, any time constraints. That's a little bit of a wake up call. I think it's outstanding. Troy? You're quite possibly anything, Tom, you and I say now is going to be slightly redundant because that was correct. Uh, I think well, exactly. you can go back and listen to that multiple times. Tom, I, I wrote down a few points when, before, you know, when we first started speaking about doing this episode live and obviously the story was the first part. The second one was buyer work and having a plan around what you're doing with buyers. John mentioned Jess Smith. Joe Smith had 60, 90 and 30 day plans for all her vendors. She also had those same plans for buyers. Because here's the thing with buyers right now. Traditionally, when we were having open for inspections and we were seeing a lot more people face to face, buyers were somewhat more plentiful. Now, the buyer face to face work has become buyer online inquiry work. So what are you doing around those inquiries? How much are you nurturing them and prizing them? on really taking them along the journey and seeing what they need. Because people have needs right now. There's situations where people have to buy. There's the same situations where people have to sell. So all of those inquiries are incredibly important. 
The next one is that off-market strategy that John did mention. That off-market strategy to say, right, let's get everything prepared. Even if we can't extract a buyer that we're working with right now to pay a price that you'd be willing to accept, we still have everything in play that post-COVID, if that decision is made, we will be out in front because we would have had all the elements. So what's the off-market strategy? How close are you working with those buyers? Even if you don't get the result now, you're prepared for the future. And then it was the final part, building a pipeline for success in the next six months. So what does the pipeline look like? How many connections, how many phone calls are you making to past clients, your community, um, your future pipeline that you're already dealing with pre-COVID to really get them in the headspace of, right, we're here to care, we're here to support you. What does your plans look like? Because here are some of the case studies and examples that we've seen happen in the last three weeks. It's funny, I was talking to Shane Small and Tom and, and Troy about that point in a way earlier. And he just said, you know, one of the funny things that our agents that he's coaching is talking about who are, that they seem hesitant to get on the phone because they don't want to be seen as ambulance chasing, you know, trying to take advantage of. And he said he doesn't think there'd be a, ever a time in history that people wouldn't want to hear from someone who's a, a friend or a, or a business associate that's feeling positive and upbeat, that's checking in on them to see they're okay. And he said, that's bizarre that people are hesitant to reconnect. And I agree with you, Troy, going back to Jess's Christmas metaphor, the best, the best auctions and the best listings in the year generally are just after Christmas, pent up demand. And then all of a sudden there's this surge and all the buyers that have been looking at REA and domain over the, over the break, they get out there and the first auctions, first couple of weeks of February are gangbusters. I think post COVID there is going to be a surge. Now may or may not relate to a surge in prices because we know there's some unemployment around, uh, unfortunately. Um, but I think there is going to be a real desire to get back out there, get get our property listed. So I'd be I'd be picking a date where you think COVID might be kind of returning to normal. And I'd be starting to try and get people into that timeline, those that are the 90-day plans of people that want to sell afterwards that aren't ready to go now. Um, but also don't disregard the possibility, as we saw with Mintor last week, there are people that want to kind of go in 60 days that, that you can get buyers through. 13 uh, inspections in a few hours. I think it was from about nine till two or three or something. He said he took them through about every 15, 20 minutes and then sells at 11.30 at night, listed for 11 days. Tommy, what are your final ones? Well, I'm just going to, on, on what, uh, I mean, you guys covered it very well there. and There's not much to add. On what Shane Smollin said, hey, it's a good point because one of the things that's come out of conversations that I've heard from some agents is, Tom, it's not the same. You don't want to come across too much commission breath in this marketplace. And I think that a lot of real estate agents are actually using that as an excuse to become invisible. I agree with Shane Smollin. This is the marketplace to over communicate. And anyone that's listening here right now that says, oh yeah, but you know, what, what are you going to say to people? Most people have got a database of people that often they haven't spoken to for a long time. So I'm just gonna run through three kinds of phone calls you can be doing in the database. To the people that you haven't spoke to for years and you feel guilty about it. Like you see their name there and you feel shit. I haven't spoken to them what I'm gonna say. I think it's as simple as this. Hey, it's Tom Panos here from McGar, McGrath. I wanna you know, let you know I want to apologise at the start. I should have been in touch earlier. I reckon saying sorry at the start of a phone call is a really, it, it sets the phone call and people love someone that says sorry. Secondly, I want to ask you, is there anything I can do to help or assist you in this current time? And see how the conversation goes and then maybe sort of say, what's your understanding of real estate as how you see it? So that's one call to people you haven't spoke to a long time. The second call is to people that are in your database and you have sort of had a conversation with them. And I reckon it's as simple as, hey, it's Tom Panos here. I want to let you know it's a weird time, but for us at McGrath, it's business as usual in an unusual way. This is what we've seen happen in the last two weeks. And then the third phone call is to the people that are coming onto the market very soon and they're holding off. I actually think every agent's got an obligation to beat the rush because, John, you've been in real estate and so have you, Troy, long enough to know when you're a seller, you'd rather sell in isolation, not in competition. So if you could have a two to three week advantage, 
than the rest. When COVID-19 ends, you don't want to be on a market when there's 3,000 auctions over a two-week period. You want to try to be beforehand. And that's why we get some incredible prices in January in real estate. You get some great prices because there's hardly anything on the market. Everyone's waiting for the week after Australia Day. So, um, guys, girls that are listening in, do us a favour. If you press the share, we'd love to get more people. And what we're going to do is on our next MDA, what we're going to do is during the Zoom, during the Zoom, we're going to bring in a person into the phone call, someone that we're going to pick that has shared the video, and we're going to do some live coaching, John and Troy. We're going to get them in. We're going to bring them into the conversation halfway through the thing, because I saw Gary V do it. I think it's great. It's got this raw, authentic view where you don't know the question. You just bring them in. And we're going to pick someone that shares the video, and I'll get Susan to do a, a random pick of someone, and uh, we'll have them uh, next week and we'll do uh, an MDA, and we'll also do some live coaching. That'll be awesome. Look forward to that. All right, John, Troy, I'll talk to you next week. Have a good week to all our listeners and our viewers, and we've got a surprise we're going to mention to you next week. We've got something exciting uh, coming up over the month of May. Thanks, everyone. See you, Thanks guys. See you, guys.